Okay, um, well, good afternoon and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this, our study entitled Caregiver Burden and Quality of Life for Parents of Young Children with Cystic Fibrosis. And this study was funded by the Health Research Board. And as was mentioned by Donald, um, Cathy Fitzgerald, the last person there, was the PhD student that undertook most of this research. I wasn't leading her, but she was the person on the ground doing a lot of the work. So um, she would have been here herself, but she's had a nicer, a very nice reason not to be here. <laughs> Um, so there's been growing interest in measuring quality of life and the importance of quality of life has been increasingly recognised and there's been lots of studies looking at the quality of life of patients with cystic fibrosis. There's been very little work done looking at the uh, impact of informal caregiving on the parents of children, young children in particular with cystic fibrosis. And Ireland has a very high incidence rate, almost the highest in the world, of cystic fibrosis. We have a very high carriage rate and we have a very high incidence of cystic fibrosis. So for those of you who mightn't be uh, on top of cystic fibrosis, just a couple of slides just outlining what it is so you get a sense of what the caregiving burden might be. So it's an inherited chronic disease, primarily affects the respiratory and gastrointestinal system. Um, it's autosomal recessive. Um, so you need two copies of the abnormal uh, gene to be present for the disease to develop. So if you look on the right, you can see the two parents on the top, and each of those have the red defective gene. So for every time those two parents carriers, they don't have CF, they're just carrying it, they don't know they're a carrier. Um, and each time they have a baby, they have a one in four chance of having a child with CF. Down the bottom, the, on the right-hand side, the two defective genes. And CF predominantly affects Caucasians. So cystic fibrosis can be detected in two ways. Um, clinically, first of all, which was the way it always used to be detected, either by a family history, maybe there's a CF in the family or they have a, a sibling who's got CF, and also by signs and symptoms. And then since July 2011, it can be detected through newborn blood spot screening because it commenced then in July 2011. All children who have heel prick test have CF uh, screen. So... Looking at it clinically, what kind of symptoms do patients have, young children with cystic fibrosis? So the first thing is they might have a thing called meconiomyelias, where they get their diagnosis at birth. Even without screening, they get this thick, sticky first bowel movement that can block the small intestine, and they present in that very classical way that doesn't really happen with anything else other than CF. But then later on, they present if they have chronic respiratory symptoms in early life, coughing, wheezing, difficulty breathing, and also then failure to thrive. So a baby who's not putting on sufficient weight might be referred, and cystic fibrosis in Ireland would be one of the things you think about, particularly if they had some respiratory problems as well. So that thick, sticky mucus makes those children very prone to developing breathing difficulties and also lung infection, and that's one of the key things, problems with CF. But as well as that, the thick and digestive juices make it difficult for them to absorb nutrients properly, and they get the digestive problems, and they also get failure to thrive. And the other thing that has parents have to contend with, and the children, once they become aware of it, and young adults with CF would all know all about this, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a particular pathogen in CF. And it's one of the ones that they dread getting, because it's a, a really important pathogen in the worst kind of progressive and severe CF lung disease. So it can become chronic, um, and it's very difficult to eradicate once a child has got pseudomonas infection, and there's a big focus on prevention. And there's huge work in the hospitals now about prevention of pseudomonas infection. And all of you heard all of the outcry about the Vincent's Hospital, the delay in the CF, um, opening up the, the CF wards, the new unit. That's because you have to keep all people with CF separate to prevent this pseudomonas acquisition and you have different routes in and out, clinics, and all sorts of things now, all about infection control. So it's a very big uh, focus on this now in, in, the, in all CF, especially CS, CF centres. So caring for a young child with CF is, um, carries a fairly big caregiving burden for parents. So first of all, on a daily basis, they have to do airway clearance for the baby, starting from the very beginning when the child is, is, has been diagnosed, when the child is diagnosed, they'll have a screen or they'll have, um, if they're clinically diagnosed, they'll then go on and have a sweat test and further testing. They might have genetic testing. The parents will be tested. Older siblings will be tested. All of those things are a big burden on the family, a lot of upset and upheaval at the time of the, of the finding. But then you kick in immediately with um, 
physiotherapy on a daily basis, even before the child has any symptoms. Physiotherapy and all of the things that go along with having a child CF start on day one. You've got this apparently perfect little baby and suddenly you're thrown into a caregiving, you know, big caregiving role, far more than you anticipated. So airway clearance a couple of times a day, uh, it's physiotherapy uh, that the parents do. They have to get the child to take their pancreatic enzyme supplements. Uh, they have calorie requirements. They have to have more food, more calorie requirements in various ways than other children would have. And infection control is a very big feature, as I mentioned already. Routinely then, they go to CF clinic visits every two to three months. And they have an annual assessment at a specialist CF centre. So all of these re require them to take time off work, um, extra time off work than an, an average parent would be taking. As well as that, they have to go quite a bit for education from the specialist nurses. There are CF specialist nurses in all of the specialist centres, and they would have a big role in educating parents. And parents have to go back and back for different types of education. As new things come along, as the child develops new condition, new parts of the condition develop, they may have to go for, it's not just a once-off education, it's ongoing education throughout that child's life for the parents, so they can manage the child as best as possible to get the best outcome. And then they have some other uh, problems as well, in that sometimes they put on maintenance treatments, they're more likely to have hospital admission, they're more likely to have home IV therapy and home nebulizers. So this is some data from the Cystic Fibrosis Registry of Ireland uh, of children under six years. And you can see that the, um, over half were on a mucolytic and almost half were on a bronchodilator to uh, break down the mucus and to dilate the airway, the bronchodilator. And then over half were on a neural antibiotic for at least three months in the past, uh, in the, in, uh, during the period, during that year. And then smaller numbers were on nasal medication, inhaled steroids, inhaled antibiotics. So you're talking about giving these to small children. So they're often not things that you can hand over to a, care, to a, to a, a nanny or a childminder. Creches don't often want to have children who have all of these particular concerns. So a lot of it is carried out by parents, um, and they carry most of the caregiving burden themselves. And as everyone knows here in this room, is very, very uh, familiar with, I'm sure, and more than me, uh, caring for a child with a long-term chronic disease is a very... Um, causes made, the diagnosis in the beginning causes major upheaval for the child and for the family. The whole family structure can be changed with having a child with a serious condition. It's very stressful for the parents. The daily workload, as I mentioned, in this condition is quite considerable. Uh, having a child in hospital on occasion is very stressful for a family of a young child in hospital. And <coughs> the parents having to stay in hospital and the upheaval at home. And in this condition as well, there's a lot of concern about the future, as there is with many chronic diseases in young children. But parents are very concerned about the future and how things will go. So the Cystic Fibrosis Irish Comparative Outcome Study, was the ICOS study, was a study that uh, it set out as being a longitudinal cohort study comparing children with clinical diagnosis and with, uh, diagnosed by newborn blood spot screening. And we were interested in looking at the um, clinical outcomes in those that were screened and those who presented clinically to see was screening working in Ireland as well as uh, uh, in the same way that it has worked in the trials. Because... Sometimes when something is in a service uh, setting, it's not as good or maybe better than it was in the trials. You just don't know until you actually see. And so th having, done, having this set up also gave us an opportunity to measure the impact of informal caregiving on parents of children with CF. So in the ICOS study, two cohorts of children were recruited by year of birth. And the first cohort were children clinically diagnosed with CF born in Ireland from the beginning of July 2008 to July 2011, when screening began. And the second group were children diagnosed with CF through newborn blood spot screening, born in Ireland from the 1st of July 2011 up to the end of recruitment in June 2016. And we were able then to follow up the children at various stages. We followed up children with clinically diagnosed up to age five, and we diagnosed, we followed up the children diagnosed with them um, by screening as long as we could up to our end in 2016, middle of 2016. So this was a national study um, and we were working with the six specialist um, CF centres across the country in six hospitals 
and children who are diagnosed are all, are all referred to one of the specialist paediatric CF clinics in Ireland. Um, and they're in, um, in Talla, in Crumlin, Galway, Cork, Limerick and Temple Street. And so we had tremendous buy-in from all of the consultants and CF nurses from all of those four uh, specialist centres to do this study. Um, and so informed consent was obtained from all of the parents and the clinicians and the CF nurses on our behalf obtained the informed consent uh, from the parents. So a total number, a total of 232 patients were recruited to the study, and that was a participation rate of almost 93%. Uh, of the 93 patients in the clinically di um, diagnosed cohort, one, person, one patient was excluded because they were diagnosed outside the Republic of Ireland. And for the purpose <coughs> of this, we were really interested in the um, specialist care they were receiving from birth onwards, and so we couldn't include these people uh, diagnosed outside. Um, and so that gave us 92 in the clinical cohort. In the screened cohort then, we had 139 children uh, born and followed up. Three were excluded, uh, sorry, five were excluded. Three because they were diagnosed outside Ireland and two because they had this thing called cystic fibrosis screen positive inconclusive diagnosis where there isn't, they're not diagnosed fully with CF, but it leaves the parents in a little bit of a, with a little bit of concern always. It's one of the downsides of screening when you have this type of thing happening. It's not something we'd like to see, but it does occur in small numbers. And then the, in the total uh, cohort, there were 134. So for this part of the study, for the, um, the caregiver burden, it was a, we did a cross-sectional study of the families recruited to the ICOS study. And parents were consented already, as I mentioned, and then they completed the care qual questionnaire and um, completed... Uh, via telephone consultation, and it was completed by both parents separately, the father and the mother, in the, when there was a father and a mother. And the Caraqual um, 7D was used, Caraqual was used, and I'll just go back on that, the, sorry, just go back there. Um, so it was a, the Caraqual questionnaire was the questionnaire that was used for this, and I'll just talk a little bit about the Caraqual questionnaire. So, um, for most of the studies and questions in this, they were asked to indicate whether an item applied to them with three answers, none, some, or a lot of. And the care qual questionnaire is a questionnaire that's been developed that measures caregiver burden for, for parents of children. Uh, it's based on the EuroQual, which is a standard quality of life questionnaire. And it's been used to examine the impact um, of caregiving on parents of children with various chronic diseases haemophilia, craniofacial malformations, and autism spectrum disorder. And there have been a number of validation studies which have looked at this previously, and they showed favourable results about the psychometric properties and the ability for it to uh, measure what it's meant to be measuring. So there are two components for this. The first is the visual analogue scale at the bottom there, and it is a scale that goes from 0 to 10, meaning from um, zero is completely unhappy and 10 being completely happy. And then as well as that, there's the Caraqual 7D. There are five negative dimensions of providing informal uh, care. Uh, relational problems or relationship problems with the child, mental health problems, problems combining daily activities with care, financial problems and physical health problems. And then there were two positive dimensions, fulfillment from caregiving, and social and family support when needed. And when you combine these together, you've got, uh, we could calculate what's called a utility score, US, which is a weighted average of the sub subjective burden. And it went from naught to 100. And the higher score was a higher, meant a uh, reduced burden. So a little bit not what you expect to find, but uh, high meant good, better. And we did a pilot study. Uh, we change a couple of questions, very, very slightly the wording, not, mean, not changing the sense, but just slightly so that it could be interpreted properly in Ireland. Uh, we looked at some face validity with some um, testing, and we did what's called a Chromebax Alpha, which uh, looks at the um, measure of internal consistency, and that was acceptable. So we looked, first of all, at um, whether mothers and fathers were responding to the seven components of the Caraqual in the same um, way, and we used a particular test of symmetry, uh, this McNamara-Boker test was used. 
And we also did a paired analysis to examine if there were any um, differences in the utility score, in the median uh, utility score or in the VAS, in the mother and father pairs. So in the results then, um, of the 213 families recruited to the ICOS study, at least one parent from 195 families completed the questionnaire. And in that, we had 130 mother and father pairs. So we had 189 mothers and 137 fathers, but when we paired them up, there was 130 uh, pairs that we could look at. And so looking at some of the results, uh, a total of 189 mothers, and that was a response rate of 88.7%, completed the questionnaire. And of these, 55 were mothers of preschool children aged 3 to 5 years. 64% um, of the mothers reported some or a lot of problems with their mental health. Most mothers, 91.3%, reported some or a lot of support with tasks. And 95.7% reported some or a lot of fulfilment with tasks. Uh, we then looked at the preschool group separately, uh, slightly older children, and the median uh, utility score for mothers was 82.6, and the median uh, visual analogue score was 7. When we stratified these by diagnosis method of child, either clinical or screen detected, the median utility score was a little higher in the newborn screening cohort, but this wasn't significant and there was no difference in the median uh, VAS measuring happiness. And in this slide we look at the paired comparisons of mothers and fathers. And at the top there you see the problems with mental health, father and mother. And mothers had sig reported significantly more problems with their mental health than fathers, reporting some or a lot of problems with mental health. Looking at the numbers reporting problems with their physical health and financial problems, uh, mothers reported uh, some or a lot of, uh, more than fathers, but these weren't significantly <coughs> different. And this slide looks again at the paired analysis looking at uh, the tasks, either problems combining the tasks, <coughs> support with the tasks and fulfilment with tasks, and also with the relationship problems with children, again comparing mothers and fathers. And considerable numbers of both mothers and fathers reported problems combining tasks, um, and in, in high numbers they report this, mothers more than fathers, but still high numbers in both, and not significantly different. Um, there were very few that reported any sort of relationship problems with their children. There were a, a small numbers, but most reported none. And a high number, and more than we expected, reported um, some or a lot of support with tasks, and some or a lot of fulfilment with the tasks. So this slide shows a contingency table, and here we're trying to explain <coughs> how couples responded to the care qual 7D component of the questionnaire. And here you can see the fathers um, in rows, in the columns, and the mothers in the rows. And so for each of these, we're comparing, we're setting them each against each other. And we did a test around the diagonal of the contingency table, and here you can see where parents agreed across the diagonal. <coughs> so looking at this uh, problem to my own mental health, we can see there was a significant difference between mothers and fathers in terms of agreement. It, for example, uh, where fathers said there was no problems with their mental health, mothers, 26.9%, 27% reported some problems with mental health. And where mothers reported no mental health problems, fathers reported 11.5% of fathers reported it. So, there were significant differences in the mothers and fathers. They didn't agree always in the pairs. Um, there was also a significant difference in terms of problems combining my care tasks with my own daily activities, uh, a significant difference in mothers and fathers. Um, there was no difference in the relationship problems with my child. And when we looked at the financial problems, they, they, they did agree quite a lot in terms of the um, financial problems and also the problems with my own physical health, no significant differences in those two um, findings. And finally, for the positive components of the Care Qual 7D, as before, we've got the fathers in the columns and the mothers in the rows, and the proportion of partner disagreement was significantly different with regard to support for um, carrying out my tasks, and 15% of, uh, of mothers uh, reported some support when their 
fathers were saying there was a lot of support um, and 7% uh, of uh, mothers saying they had a lot of support and fathers said they had some support. So this slide shows the overall results on the, um, the utility score on VAS for the total cohort and uh, both mothers and fathers had a high median utility and the VAS score but the fathers were significantly higher than the mothers in both of these. And when we looked at it compared by older and younger children, we split it at 40 months because that was our median age. And we, we saw that there were significant differences in the mothers and fathers. The fathers, again, having better scores, indicating more happiness and less burden than the mothers. But at, in the younger age, youngest age group, only the happiness score was different. The, um, utility score was the same. And finally then we looked at, we did a regression analysis. We used this um, mix, uh, linear mixed models method and this really is to predict what were the main things that predicted the highest caregiver burden and to see which things came out. So we put all of these things into a model and we looked to see, I mean, we adjusted for each, for each other, which ones would come out most strongly as being uh, important and the things that came out as being uh, most important were increasing age of the child within this age group of 0 to 5 years, uh, being a mother, and also having Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, infection. So in conclusion, um, mental health problems are an issue for caregivers of young children with CF, and mothers report this more frequently than fathers. Um, high proportions of parents uh, reported good social support and the majority of parents said they found, some sound, found good fulfilment from carrying out their care tasks. Um, as I've just mentioned, the factors associated with high care, caregiver burden, we expected infection with pseudomonas, we uh, expected probably increasing age of the child because very young babies, parents have a high caregiver burden anyway, and they expect to be doing a lot for their children, <coughs> but they expect to be doing a little less as the child gets that little bit older. And so that increasing age, for two reasons, one, the expectation is different, but also children may be requiring more treatments as they get that little bit older, they'll be getting more treatments. Um, the clinical diagnosis did not predict increased caregiver burden. So in our other part of our study, we found that screening and screened children had fewer hospitalizations um, and fewer uh, IV treatments at home. So they were doing better. Uh, they did better in height, they're doing better in weight, fewer hospitalizations and less IV treatment at home. But that still didn't impact on the caregiver burden. They were the, the parents were the same. So one of the reasons we think that possibly was the way it, it worked out was that perhaps they had... Um, it was some time, I suppose, since the diagnosis for many of the parents. They've had some time to adjust, get used to the caregiver burden, and perhaps that's why we don't see a difference in the two, um, even though, as I said, the children who were screen detected had less uh, of some of the things you associate with the caregiver burden. Um, the other thing that we found uh, slightly unusual, the utility and the VAS scores were higher than we thought. And we've discussed this with a few clinicians and some of the CF consultants. And one of the things that is thought, we think, is perhaps that um, they're considering it maybe a challenge rather than a burden as such, that they're looking at sort of some of the positives, that they're, it's a challenge looking for the after the child, but not a burden. So they're not classifying it as a burden as such. And the other thing that was um, of concern was the high proportion of mothers reporting mental health issues. And this really highlights the importance of assessing the psychological well-being of parents of young children with CF and also uh, parents of young children who have any kind of chronic dis condition that requires a, a big caregiver burden. And it's important, as with any mental health issue, it's important to recognise and intervene if any mental health issues arise. <coughs> and in this, I suppose the family, there's lots of people involved in a, the care of a child with CF. So the family themselves, clinicians, specialist CF nurses and GPs are key to identifying mental health issues in parents. And it's been recognised as this is one of the main concerns, and there are now psychologists as part of the specialist CF teams. You wouldn't have psychologists in the teams around all of the hospitals all over the country who do with CF, but in the six specialist units, they now have brought in psychologists as part of a specialist team, because it's recognised increasingly 
that the psychologist is uh, important for the children as they get older, but also for the parents. You know, increasingly it's been, it's been shown that it's important for the parents. So when we finished the study, and we have, uh, we were, we've submitted this for publication, but we also went back to all of the centres. We've presented it at most of the centres, we've presented the results, and all of the psychologists are very, very interested in the results that we've got because it's one of the first um, studies that's in Ireland that's looked at this in terms of caregiver burden. One of the issues we had was we had to use uh, a relatively short questionnaire. Children with CF and parents with CF get um, a lot of uh, the thing called participant burden, or patient participant burden. There's lots of studies going on. And there was a big quality of life study going on at the same time in more and older CF pair patients. Uh, and it wasn't going to really interfere with us, but there was a concern that we couldn't use a very long questionnaire. And as well as that, we were doing, at the same time, we were doing a cost questionnaire. So we wanted to get a sh relatively short questionnaire. Um, it may not have been the perfect one. And there is, in, in, there is work being done in the UK. Our, our extern who was over and who's working on other um, work with us they're developing a, a new way of assessing caregiver burden and he's very interested for us to do that in an Irish context and see how well the care qual stands up against a more detailed one. But for the purposes of this, um, we felt this was a good start in terms of <coughs> highlighting some of the issues that exist for, for um, the carers of young children with CF. Thank you very much. <laughs>